Uh, welcome everyone um, to the Osher Mini Medical School uh, series, lecture series on yoga for tr self transformation, awakening to the possibilities within. This particular series that we've organized is really intended to be more of a lecture format in which we're going to share information about um, some yoga history and philosophy. We may share some clinical examples um, as well as some recent research studies. Um, we will occasionally uh, throw in a few experiential meditative sessions here and there, but for the most part, this is really going to be a lecture format. So um, with that, um, let me go ahead and introduce uh, my co-chair who has been partnering with me in organizing this lecture series um, uh, today. And uh, her name is Dr. Priya Jain. And Priya completed her medical degree at the University of Kentucky, followed by a residency in pediatrics at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Um, she specializes in the care of adolescents with anxiety and depression, and she attained her yoga teacher training certificate in Rishikesh, India. Following that, she completed a year-long movement arts diploma from Attakalari Center for Movement Arts in Bangalore, India. Priya? Thank you, Sudha. Thank you so much. I'm really, really glad to be here and be a part of this. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce Sudha for you. You've already been hearing from her, but um, Dr. Sudha Pratikanti, she got her medical degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and then went on to do a psychiatry residency and fellowship at UCSF. She's traveled throughout India and Asia. She's studied much yoga, Ayurveda, and uh, Advaita Vedanta. She's also a diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine, and she's also a certified Ayurvedic practitioner. At the UCSF Osher Center, where both of us work, she founded both the Integrative Psychiatry Service and the Ayurveda Consultation Service. So thank you. I'm really glad to be doing this with you, um, Sudha. And we're actually really excited for um, the lecture series that we have coming up for you guys. I'm just gonna go ahead into what we have for today. And today, like we said, we're going into what is yoga. And this is a bit about the perspectives on yoga's journey from East to West, sort of how we've gotten to where we are today. So to start this session off, I thought that I would ask the very basic question of what is yoga, right? I mean, in modern times, when somebody says yoga, for, us, for most of us, I think there's some images that come to mind. Those images are usually gonna look like something like this, right? There's gonna be people in different poses, sometimes really um, eccentric poses, some very difficult to do poses, and they associate it with this idea of flexibility. Now, it's a good question whether or not that is truly yoga. And whenever there's something that I want to know a little bit more about, or a little bit more deeply about, the first thing I do, which I assume lots of you do too, is I Google it. And so that's what I did. I wanted to know what Google was going to tell me. So I Googled yoga, and the first thing that popped up was an ad to, uh, for me to join Core Power Yoga for two weeks. And following that was like various other types of yoga advertisements and different studios and different types and different prices. Now, many people know that yoga originated in what is current day India. And you're probably thinking, you know, I didn't know core power yoga was that old. No, obviously I'm kidding. But what yoga is and what yoga has become are very different from each other. And that's what we wanna do our best to try to explain. We wanna explain that journey that yoga has taken from what it was to where we are now with it. Now in its broadest sense, the word yoga, it comes from the Sanskrit root word, which is yuj. And yuj means to unite. But what exactly is it that we're uniting here? Now one of the most popular or well-known definitions of yoga is that yoga is the union of the universal, of the individual, sorry, it's the union of the individual soul or consciousness with universal consciousness. Well, what does that mean? Because that sounds very difficult to really understand. So maybe think of it like this. Right now, on this earth, there's an oak tree and a palm tree growing, both growing on this earth. There's also humans and dogs and many other beings growing on this earth. 
but all of them are part of the same earth. They're not separate from each other when we talk about the earth. Now the process of these beings realizing that their place is a part of the earth and not separate from it, that's a way of thinking what yoga is. So when an individual realizes their higher self, their connectedness as part of the universe or universal energy or consciousness, the uniting of the individual with the universal, that is yoga. Now, another way of seeing this might be thinking about how a river pours into an ocean. You can see in this picture that the river is literally uniting with something that's much greater than itself. And the river may actually be losing its idea of itself as it joins and unites with the ocean. Now, one thing about yoga is it's something that, it's something difficult to understand when one is trying to read it in a book. In fact, they say that it is not something that you can really know just by reading a book or reading a facts about it. It's something that you have to experience and it's only through this experience of uniting with universal consciousness that somebody can really understand it and really have the real knowledge about it. And it's difficult to understand. It's very difficult to understand. But interestingly, some parts of modern science have actually begun to corroborate some of the yogic sciences. And if anybody here, and I am definitely not an expert in this, but if anybody here is studying in quantum physics, you might be somewhat familiar with these ideas. So quantum sciences tells you that everything in the universe is energy and that this energy can actually pop in and out of material existence. Sometimes it manifests as a solid phenomenon, like a particle that we can feel. And other times you can't see it at all. You have no idea that it's even there physically. Now, when the science is looking for what that energy is, what particle it is, well, what they find is that there's no actual physical matter there. When one asks, what is the universe or what is our planet or what are, what are our bodies made of? What is everything made of? you're kind of left with this head scratching answer of everything is actually nothing. Because when you're searching for what that absolute tiny particle is that all matter is made out of, it actually ends up not being there. But then the questions that yoga asks is, who are you or who am I? Are you or am I the mind? And if so, what exactly does that mean? Are you the matter that makes up the brain? Are you the electrical stimuli that creates movements in the brain? And if so, what is it that creates these thoughts? Because many studies have looked at the brain and they found they failed to find any sort of like conductor of all the brain activities. There's no cluster of cells or no subatomic particle that's underlying it all. And so when you keep going deeper, we find that there's energies, but no tangible solid matter. And so when we say, who are you or what are you? We can't really say that you are the brain or you are the body because when you look deeper and deeper, there's nothing actually there. Yoga and modern science, science tells us the same thing that we're not the mind because if we were, we'd be able to find it. We're not the body because if we were, we'd find something solid somewhere down there. And there's nothing within us that constitutes a solid I. So then we're left with that question, who are we or what are we? So far, modern science doesn't have an answer for us, but that is kind of where yoga comes in to answer that. Yoga offers us an answer. It shows us that through our awareness and our consciousness, we can see ourselves as we, as we actually are. And that is consciousness itself, the unchanging, omnipresent, omniscient self. Now, if you've lost me and you're sitting there saying, I have no idea what she's saying, that is completely fine. And if you're left trying to figure out what you are, then I think you absolutely understood. Now let's go back and go through a brief history, very brief history of ancient yoga. Now we really don't know how long yoga itself has existed. Some say that it existed at the very, very beginning of time because it predates the written word. Ancient yogic lore says that about 15,000 years ago or so, 
they, there came what's known as the very, very first yogi. That's known as Adi Yogi. Adi Yogi is also sometimes referred to as Shiva, but in yogic lore, they, that they are referred to as Adi Yogi. Now, Adi Yogi was, was said to be found in the Himalayas, alternating between wild dancing and absolute stillness, as if something had taken over his body and his spirit. Now, other sages of the time, they wanted to know what it was that Adi Yogi knew. But Adi Yogs told them that they weren't prepared to get this knowledge yet. And so some of the sages went through many, many years of preparing themselves, preparing their mind, preparing their body. And then finally, Adi Yog shared with seven of the sages this knowledge that he knew. And it's really from then on that the, the sharing of yoga and the knowledge of yoga started. So again, according to yogic lore, that's about 15,000 years ago. But then we move to some of the first documentation of yoga that we have. And that comes from an area called the Mohenjo-Daro area, which is one of the largest settlements of the Indus Valley civilization. So we're going to about 3000 BC. And this is where we get the first signs of yogic postures. These are called the Harappa seals. You see that picture on top, this carving. And then you've got these figurines, these clay figurines that are also found from the area, which again, dated back to that time period in 3000 BCE. Now, basically what we know now is that at least, at least that far back is when we have ideas of yoga, right? But again, the yoga floor says more, more like 15,000 years ago or even prior to that. Now, going back to these seven sages that I talked about who learned from Adi Yogi. Like I said before, this predated the written text. And so the knowledge from those sages was passed on from teacher to students in a very special oral tradition. And what we're seeing here is sort of a, it's a view of the traditional way of how knowledge was shared. There's a teacher sitting with students very often under a tree and they're truly sharing this knowledge orally. This verbal tradition, it actually involved the chanting of verses. And the chanting itself has a particular musicality and tone to it. The pronunciation and the repetition, all of that had an important part to this transmission of knowledge. And actually it's said that this way of, of sharing information is actually said to help develop somebody's mental powers and strength. It helps ease stress and it takes one to a higher level of consciousness. Now, I just wanted to play a short clip of an example of this uh, Vedic chanting right now. I hope you could notice some of that musicality and some of that tonality that goes along with that. Now for many, many millennia, this knowledge was passed down through word of mouth in this chanting tradition. Once the written word was finally developed, scholars obviously began writing it down, which brings us though to some of the most important Indian scriptures, which are known as the Vedas. Now the Vedas, they were written approximately 1500 to 500 BCE, which is also known as the Vedic time period. And the knowledge during this time period was compiled into four volumes, okay? That's four volumes are the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda. Now you can think of this as ancient Wikipedia. Okay, that's how a lot of people think of it because they contained information and knowledge from a vast array of subjects, from atoms and agriculture, to math and economics, to art and philosophy. Now, all four volumes were written within the Vedic time period, but they're actually divided by the times that they were written. They're not divided by subject matter, with the Rig Veda being the eldest of all of them. So from these Vedas, the question is, how do we get exactly to yoga from here? So we have our four Vedas, right, our four volumes. Now, this is a gross simplification, but each of these volumes contained part a practical form of knowledge. That's your agriculture, your economics, things like that. 
And then they contained a section at the end of each one that deals with questions of philosophy and spirituality. Now, each one of these volumes had both of these, the practical aspect and the philosophical aspects to them. Now, when you put all the philosophical parts together, those collectively are known as Vedanta or the Upanishads. It's known by both names. Vedanta literally means the end of the Vedas because it's at the end of each of these volumes of the Vedas. Now, when one looks at these philosophical Upanishads or Vedantas with the questions of who am I or what am I, it's really from that that yoga itself is derived. So if we move on for in history, okay, we're moving on from that Vedic period to now to a period about 200 BC to about 150 BCE, give or take a little bit on both sides. And this period is known as a classical period. And during this classical period came along a great sage known as Sage Patanjali, who you're seeing a sculpture of here. Now, Patanjali is often known, especially nowadays, as the founder or the father of yoga. Now, he didn't actually create yoga, but he took the parts of the Upanishads that dealt with yoga, or again, dealt with the union of the self to a higher self, and he codified them into a very well-known text. And that text is known as the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's from this text that many types of yoga has come. And even today, this text is noted as to be the ultimate authority on modern yoga. Now we'll come back to Patanjali's yoga in a little bit, but for a moment, I wanna take a, a, a brief sidetrack and talk about the different types or the different paths of a yogi. Now, oftentimes when we use the word yoga, we're referring to a path that leads you to an ultimate realization of truth. You may have heard many terms or different types of yoga, maybe things like restorative yoga, like kundalini yoga, vinyasa yoga, bhakti yoga, or hatha yoga, many, many more. And then you've even probably heard terms like beer yoga and goat yoga. And I'm not a yogi, but I can guarantee that I'm pretty sure that neither of those two are gonna get you to the ultimate truth, but they're there and they're in modern day forms. Now, when we talk about all these types of yoga, they're not actually separate paths from each other. In fact, they're not separate types of yoga at all. These are all just different types of a part of yogic practice. It's a little bit inaccurate to call them separate types of yoga as they're not separate paths of their own, but it might be more apt to say that these are different adaptations of certain facets or different parts of a yogic practice. So if we really talk about different paths of yoga, at the heart of the matter, there's really only two main yogic paths. There's a path of the dhyana yoga, and then there's a path of the karma yoga or the Jnana Yogi or the Karma Yogi, okay? Now, the first one, Jnana Yoga, this is the path of the one who is trying to devote themselves to pure knowledge. This word itself, Jnana means to know. And it's the path for those, like I said, who exclusively uh, pursue pure knowledge. So people say that it might be the path of the ascetic, which is also known as the sannyasi somebody who's renounced their role in society and has devoted them to this practice exclusively. Then there's the karma yoga. Karma literally means action. So this is the path that somebody follows. It's a lifestyle that somebody follows if they're gonna continue to be part of society and they continue to have their obligatory duties in society. Now they still have the commitment to the pursuit of knowledge, but while doing so, they're still remaining an active member, literally taking actions. I know that sounds maybe kind of easy, right? It sounds a little bit easier than the ascetic because it sounds like all of us are doing that, right? We're all members of society and most of us want to pursue some sort of ultimate truth or get gain more ultimate knowledge. It's not quite so easy because volumes have been written on how to be or how to practice this idea of karma yoga. It involves adopting an attitude of deep, very deep acceptance that one has choice of action, but they don't have choice of result. 
Now, talking about this more in depth is much past the limits of the time that we have together, but the takeaway here is that there is two main paths that one can follow when they're adopting a yogic lifestyle. Again, one of the Yana yoga and one is the Karma yoga. Now, whether one chooses one path or another, they're gonna use certain practices in their pursuit of knowledge. Some of these practices, some of the more important parts of these practices are gonna be one that's known as Bhakti Yoga and another one that's known as Dhyana Yoga. Again, these aren't separate paths, so I'm gonna actually stop referring to them as yogs, but I'm just gonna call them Bhakti and Dhyana. So Bhakti is the practice of devotion. It's a practice that comes from very deep emotion or some describe it as a very pure form of love. You might see bhakti practices in uh, things like performing rituals or maybe singing devotional songs. Dhyan, on the other hand, is the practice of contemplation and meditation. It's also known as Raja Yoga. And this is a form of yoga that requires a great deal of self-discipline. Now this dhyana or raja is actually quite well known today. And because of that, I wanna expand a little bit more on this raja yoga. Remember I said, we're gonna come back to this sage Patanjali and I'm coming back to him because sage Patanjali actually wrote quite a bit on, on raja yoga and this type of yoga. And it became, to, became known now as Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga. Now, I want to make sure you know that Patanjali wrote on many aspects of yoga, but Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga is what has become very, very popular and very well known today. So let's go over this practice. We've got this eight limbs of this practice. And so you, just so you know, this is also known as Ashtanga yoga. Now this is different. If you've been to an Ashtanga yoga class, that's a set of different postures. Ashtanga yoga in this sense actually means eight limbs, ashta meaning eight and anga meaning limbs. Now this is a sequence of classical yoga, okay, which, which we talk about because it stems from this classical period in which Patanjali had actually, that's the time when Patanjali had codified his yoga. And these eight limbs actually start from the outer self and move towards the inner self. So let's start at the top with yama. Yama is translated into a code of ethics, and these can sort of be thought as your rules or maybe your don'ts, okay? So they're things like don't harm others, don't steal, don't be possessive, don't lie, don't commit infidelity. Then we move over to the niyamas. Niyamas are translated as self-disciplines. These are your habits or maybe your do's as opposed to your don'ts in the yamas. They include things like the purity of self, your habits like we talked about, your habits of speech, your habits of thinking, acceptance and tolerance of others, persistence and perseverance, reflection and self-introspection, as well as deep contemplation. Then continuing on to the third limb, we move on to asana, which has to do with the physical body. This is probably a type of yoga that you are all familiar with, you guys have seen, or a facet of yoga, I should say rather, that most people have seen that's most popularized today. Now, asana actually, as, as described by Patanjali, is being in a posture that one can hold steadily and comfortably over time, being relaxed and motionless in the posture. So any pose that's causing pain or restlessness or shaking, that's not a yoga posture. And one may have to work to develop it into a yogic posture. Moving right along, we've got pranayama. Pranayama you may have heard of as well, and this is the breath. Prana means breath and ayama means restraint. So this practice of pranayam is about consciously regulating the breath. Then we get to the fifth limb, which is pratihara. This means the withdrawal of the senses. Now this pratihara process is, it's not closing your eyes or just plugging your ears. You're not trying to stop your senses, but rather than that, it's about regulating your mind's processes to the senses. This practice, what it does, it, it empowers somebody to stop being controlled by their external world. 
So even in the face of many different things, you know, that might be coming to your senses, your own self and your own mind can be truly unaffected by them. And moving on, we come to dharana. Now, dharana is loosely translated as concentration. And this is also sometimes translated as one pointedness of the mind. It's a practice of the mind holding on and focusing to a particular inner state or topic. Maybe this is focusing on the breath or a part of the body or a particular concept, but you are focusing on one thing in this practice. We're going to distinguish that from dhyana, which is translated as meditation. Now, if the previous dharna was concentration and that was focusing on one object, dhyana is the non judgmental observation of that object. It's the complete flow of awareness through the object. So, another way of thinking of it if your concentration or your dharna is on the sun, one might notice the sun's color, the sun's brightness, its luminosity, or other aspects of it. But if one is doing dhyana or meditation on the sun, they may simply observe the sun's being without being interrupted by any of the characteristics of the sun. And then finally, we have samadhi, which is sort of the ultimate goal that we're going for in yoga. Samadhi is translated as oneness. And when, when one is meditating and they actually lose their own awareness of the meditation, it's at that point that they reach that union or that oneness, that yoga that we talked about, that union that we talked about as a definition right in the very beginning. So this was just a very, very brief intro of Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga. And so then if we just wanna recap real quick historically, we began this with the absolute ancient of times where we had Adi Yogi in the Himalayas and then he spread his knowledge through millennia through word of mouth. Then we came to the Vedic period in which the Vedas were literally written down and then they were compiled into the Upanishads or the Vedanta. That's where the philosophical part of the Vedas were compiled. And then I, it, I should actually say that around that same time, what was sometimes considered the pre-classical era came another very important work, which is called the Bhagavad Gita. It's a very famous yogic work. And that came about, you could say around the same time along with the Upanishads and Vedanta, probably a little bit after, but still prior to the classical period, which is where Patanjali and his classical yoga come about. And now to follow that up, I'm gonna turn it over to Sudha to take us on the rest of this journey. Thank you so much, Priya. It's a really great um, overview, a bird's eye view of the history of yoga all the way from prehistory to the classical era. And when we talk about classical era, we're actually talking about roughly um, uh, maybe 500, 600 BCE to about 200 CE. So just very roughly. Um, but at this point, we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk a little bit about how does Patanjali's classical yoga philosophy compare to some of the other yoga traditions and philosophies that came afterwards. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a, a little bit of a deep dive into uh, some of the theory behind uh, yoga philosophy. Um, but it's, you know, obviously I'm not going to be able to go as in depth as, um, as I think the subject really warrants, but this is just to give you a bit of an overview of some of the differences and similarities really in um, the way that the philosophy behind yoga really got expounded and uh, transmitted. So I'm going to go back to Patanjali's yoga that Priya just shared with you all the details of. So, so she shared some of the practices and the steps that are involved with Patanjali's yoga. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the philosophy of classical yoga is dualist in nature, which means that in the beginning, according to yoga philosophy, there was not a singularity but rather two infinite eternal entities, namely Purusha, which is sometimes translated as spirit, but really means consciousness, and Prakriti, which is nature, and that's sometimes translated as matter. Now these two, Purusha and Prakriti, fuse with each other to form the Jiva, which is a sentient being like all of us human beings, 
um, a sentient being with a sense of an individual ego. Now, the Purusha is the principle of pure consciousness. It's, it's absolutely distinct from ordinary ego level consciousness because ego level consciousness is marked by a kind of turbulence of thoughts, emotions, and sensations. But in a very highly organ evolved organism like human beings, the proximity of Purusha to Prakriti creates this phenomenon of ordinary ego consciousness. But nature by itself, the human mind body on its own, is considered to be utterly unconscious uh, within um, the Panthanjali system. So how does this absolutely transcendental consciousness have any effect at all on the ongoing processes of nature? It's a kind of philosophical conundrum, but the way that Patanjali addresses that is to say that nature in the form of the psyche acts like a mirror for the light of consciousness. And this gives rise to the illusion that we are actually individuated body-mind complexes with our own consciousness, rather than having it be a reflection of transcendental consciousness. So this illusion is the source of our attachment as well as our aversions um, to our ego level reality, as well as our general hunger for life, the survival instinct. So what Patanjali says is that the attenuation of our attachments and aversions and the ultimate transcendence um, out of nature and into identification with Purusha is the objective of this whole yoga system that Priya just outlined for us. So in this Patanjali's yoga system, this path to recognition of our true nature as Purusha, pure consciousness, is done into, has two different aspects to it. The first is that we need to develop a dispassion, it's called vairagya in Sanskrit, a dispassion um, for this world of matter. And this allows us to disentangle our false identification with everything that's related to the realm of nature. And then after that, the second aspect of this practice of Patanjali's yoga is really about identifying with the self, our true self, Purusha, through repeated meditative absorption and ecstasy in the state of uh, deep samadhi. That's what it's all leading to is samadhi. But these meditative aspects hopefully will lead to this deep samadhi, which is a direct experience of our true nature of pure consciousness. So even though this eightfold path of Patanjali's yoga became very influential in all the subsequent schools of yoga that developed in India, um, his dualistic metaphysics have always been considered a bit of an oddity uh, within the fold of the Vedic spiritual tradition. Most yoga schools um, during his time and in subsequent periods actually espoused one or another form of non-dualism. This is called Advaita in Sanskrit. And this non-dualist tradition in yoga can be traced all the way back to the Rig Veda. And here's actually a quote from the, one of the Upanishads. There is only the absolute. Everything in the manifest universe is pure consciousness, the pure absolute. There is nothing but bliss, the supreme bliss of absolute consciousness. So this experience of ecstatic unity that's expressed in the Upanishads, in this particular quote in the Upanishads, but many others, the most famous one is um, Tatvamasi, I am that. That which I perceive to be myself is actually this infinite consciousness um, that already exists and which I don't recognize uh, is my true identity. So this experience of ecstatic unity that's expressed in all of these Upanishadic passages really constitute the heart of Vedanta, the heart of the Vedanta wisdom tradition. And the sages of the early Upanishads were the first to speak of this grand realization explicitly and with quite unbridled enthusiasm as a lived experience. So from their non-dual insight of the oneness between Purusha and Prakriti, this is the metaphysics that they developed. There is only one consciousness, Purusha, but through the veiling and projective power of Maya, Purusha appears as though to be in the manifest, it appears to be in the manifest world as a plurality that we see around us. And so through Maya, Purusha appears as a manifest world, including the Jiva. 
The non-dual teachings of the Upanishads guide us in guide us, the jiva, in learning how to dissolve the veil of Maya. And once the veil of Maya is dissolved, we come to the blissful recognition of the singular pure consciousness as the ground of the entire manifest universe and our own embodied self. Now, this mystical realization of an all-embracing unity is not characteristic of Patanjali's yoga. In fact, he did not accept the Upanishadic um, equation of purusha with prakriti, which equates the transcendent purusha with the imminent prakriti, but they're one and the same from this uh, Vedantic viewpoint, but Patanjali did not accept that. However, all of the yoga teachings that succeeded Patanjali realigned with non-dual philosophy, and these are all collectively referred to as the post-classical yoga philosophies. Now, the yoga philosophies in this post-classical period really reflected the resurgence of this non-dual metaphysics um, called Advaita Vedanta. Um, so all of these post-classical yoga philosophies sought to spiritualize nature and the body rather than seeking to transcend them, which is a very, very big aspect of uh, Patanjali's yoga. Remember, it was about disentangling from prakriti, from nature. And um, in the post-classical yoga philosophies, though, the idea is that we re-spiritualize nature and the body rather than seeing them as separate from us and trying to transcend them. So the goal was really to integrate bodily existence with spiritual reality. So in other words, why do we have to think of the world and therefore the mind body as an enemy that has to be overcome? This was a question that all of the post-classical yoga philosophies were attempting to address. So one of these post-classical yoga philosophies that I'm going to touch on now um, is the Tantra yoga tradition. Now, the Tantra yoga tradition really has its roots in ancient goddess worship, which was quite prevalent um, throughout India and from ancient times. Uh, but it was only really around the 500 common era that these ancient practices started to be written down and codified um, into texts um, around uh, 500 CE. Uh, but all of these ancient tantric teachings and um, approach are really dedicated to prakriti, the feminine psychocosmic principle, you know, shakti, also known as shakti or devi. But it's really about re-spiritualizing prakriti. That's like a very important aspect of all of the tantra tradition. Now, it's been argued that tantra is really a kind of grassroots adaptation of Advaita Vedanta. Um, and it's often been criticized by the orthodoxy as not really being, you know, part of the orthodox um, approach to understanding the non-dual nature of reality. Um, but it was basically um, still, when you look at the actual roots of it and the actual precepts of it, it really is um, a kind of a dialectical response to this very abstract approach of Advaita Vedanta and something that was really considered to be much more approachable and usable by the everyday person. So in this sense, it's considered to be grassroots rather than being a kind of elite philosophy that only a small number of people could have access to. So in the Tantra philosophy, they're really responding to this very widely felt need for more practical orientation that would really integrate lofty metaphysical ideals of non-dualism with down-to-earth procedures for how to live a sanctified life, how to live a life without abandoning one's belief in the, um, at the importance of the body and in the idea that the prakriti, the body and all of the manifest universe is actually part of, this is, is identical to purusha, it's identical to purusha, is non-different from purusha. So um, this idea that matter and spirit are one reality and that there's no need to reject the body or to transcend the body to find higher truth is a very important aspect of Tantra philosophy, and you can see how it very much is aligned with Advaita Vedanta. Now, the actual physical yoga practices of Tantra were not really different from what Priya just described in terms of the different steps of Raja Yoga or Patanjali's yoga, but there were often additional rituals that were added to these practices to symbolically unify 
Prakriti and Purusha while the yoga practitioner was doing these um, various uh, steps. So for example, I've shown here in this picture um, a diagram of the Sri Yantra mandala, uh, which is found throughout um, India and in all kinds of ancient temples. Um, and this idea of the Sri Yantra mandala is it is supposed to depict in a very abstract um, geometrical form, the union of Prakriti and Purusha. So Prakriti is um, seen as an upward facing triangle and Purusha is seen as a downward facing triangle. So the idea here is that the downward facing triangle is Purusha being manifest in the world. And then the, uh, and then the task of those of us who are part of this manifest universe is as Prakriti, is to trans is to basically understand our unification. It's the upward pointing triangle, understanding our unification with Purusha. So the, the symbolic unity of Prakriti and Purusha creates all of this multitude of the manifest universe that we see here depicted in all of these different triangles. It's really important to note that in the Tantra Yoga tradition is also when we first get the mention of Kundalini. And we're going to be coming back to Kundalini again. Um, in, uh, in this uh, later part of this presentation, but the Kundalini Shakti is considered to be like when Purusha manifests as Prakriti, that energy of manifestation is, is considered to be Kundalini, is, is, uh, is visualized as sort of coiled serpent, it's just a symbolic depiction of that Shakti or energy of Purusha in the manifest world. So we'll be coming back to that uh, in just a bit. Now, the Tantra yoga tradition um, really then influenced a subsequent um, yoga philosophy or yoga tradition called Hatha yoga tradition. Um, really, um, the historians really consider Hatha yoga to be directly rooted in Tantra philosophy and practices, and perhaps is just considered to be a kind of outgrowth in many ways. Like uh, the Tantra tradition, Hatha yoga also says that it's teachings and practices really originated with, uh, with Shiva, Adiyogi or Adinat, Shiva. So, um, and then this great teaching of yoga was passed on to humankind by sage Matsyendranath and his great disciple Gorakshanath. Um, and this is just a depiction of the two of them. And um, these two individuals lived somewhere around 800 to 900 CE. In the Hatha Yoga tradition, um, the aim is still self-realization, just as in Raj Yoga that Patanjali laid out, um, samadhi and self-realization. But it really emphasizes, just as in the Tantra tradition, that the body needs to be part of the journey. That instead of just seeing the body as something um, that just needs to be kept balanced and healthy enough to be able to engage in the meditative practices, which are considered to really lead to samadhi or self-realization, as in the Patanjali tradition, that the body is actually engaged in a very active way in the Hatha tradition. It's actually considered to be actually a, a, a divine instrument that could be um, uh, just a, a legitimate path for opening to one's identity with Purusha, rather than being something to be transcended. So um, let me just get back for a minute to what Hatha actually means. So Hatha is a Sanskrit word, which can be broken down into two smaller words, Ha meaning sun and Ta meaning moon. So it also can mean forceful or willful. So this refers then to using great effort to recognize or unify the sun and the moon uh, within us. And this refers um, in, the Hatha, in the Hatha Yoga tradition to the balance of masculine aspects, which are considered to be um, the solar side and the feminine aspects, receptive, cool, and lunar side within all of us. Hatha Yoga tradition then is a path towards balance and uniting of opposites. Um, and so this, this kind of uh, solar energy and lunar energy is, uh, I'll, I'll touch on that in one of the next slides, but this is a very important aspect in Hatha Yoga as to how, um, how the manifest universe, how the energetics of the body um, could be channeled and moved and manipulated to actually help us 
to awaken to our true nature as uh, Purusha. The practice of Hatha Yoga focuses on total mastery of the physical body, including all its bodily functions, so that they can be engaged actively in the spiritual pursuit. The more advanced and esoteric aspects of Hatha Yoga really emphasizes activating the chakras to uh, stimulate the Kundalini Shakti and promote spiritual and, and psychic wholeness. But short of activating the Kundalini Yoga, there are also ways though to just um, really work with the energies of the body to really um, create uh, a sort of balanced, glowing, healthy body mind uh, that's really prepared for this deeper spiritual journey. And so a lot of Hatha Yoga techniques are focused on detoxifying, strengthening, and balancing the multiple dimensions of being, which they really laid out as part of the yogic body. And this is what we'll look at now on the next slide. So according to the Hatha Yoga tradition, every one of us has five bodies, and each of these are made of increasingly finer grades of energy. The five progressively subtler bodies that comprise um, who we are are described in a yoga classic called the Taitriya Upanishad. These five bodies are called koshas or sheaths in Sanskrit because each layer fits into the next like a sword in a scabbard. Only the densest is made of matter as we know it, and then the other four are energy states that are invisible to the physical eye, though we can easily sense their presence inside us when we, play, when we pay close attention. And since the inner bodies are the source of our well-being during life and are the vehicles that we travel in after death, India's ancient yogis developed specific exercises to strengthen and tone each one of these. So you can see here in these five bodies, the Annamaya Kosha is considered to be the densest, that's the physical body. Then the Pranamaya Kosha is the energy body, which is responsible for all physiological functions that we consider to be life. And then there's the Manamaya Kosha, which is considered to be the kind of emotional body, the mind. Um, and then there's a Vignanamaya Kosha, which is considered to be the intellect or wisdom. And then the on and the mayakosha, which is considered to be sort of like our innermost um, uh, manifestation of purusha and considered to be the bliss body, on and the mayakosha. So each one of these bodies then has particular practices or techniques um, that are used to kind of tone and harmonize um, these particular dimensions. Um, so you'll see here on the left hand side that. I put, uh, I put down all of the um, techniques which are supposed to be used at each of these levels. And you'll recognize that these are all the same terms as in Patanjali's system. But here the, in the Hatha Yoga tradition, they're actually understood to be working at each of these different um, levels of the yogic body. So um, what's one of the things that's unique to the Hatha Yoga tradition is actually a variety of cleansing techniques, like, for example, nasal irrigation, the cleansing of the bowels, um, irrigation of the stomach. These are all considered to be cleansing techniques which are quite unique to Hatha Yoga and which are part of toning and healing and balancing the Annamaya Kosha, the physical body. Then there's also another really uh, unique aspect of Hatha Yoga, which are mudras and bands. So mudras and bands are key techniques to work with the energy, um, energy patterns in the body. So mudras are physical gest gestures that are made, uh, often with the hands or with the eyes, but sometimes involving the whole body. And then bands or bandhas are locks, energy locks, a particular way of like holding the body to sort of contain the energy and manipulate it through uh, some of the channels here uh, in particular ways. Now you'll notice that mudra and bandha here are in the are uh, aimed at uh, pranamaya kosha, and of course the pranayams are also there, which are the same as from Patanjali's yoga. And then uh, the manamaya kosha is where Patanjali, where you know. Um, uh, in the Hatha Yoga system, this is considered to be that the withdrawal of sensory stimuli that Priya was explaining earlier. This is actually supposed to help compose, you know, and calm the turbulent mind. 
and really like prepare it, you know, for deeper levels of meditative practice. Now in the Hatha tradition, dharana is not actually mentioned as following pratyahara. So this is one of the small places where it sort of deviates from Patanjali. A dharana, which is concentration, as Priya was explaining, is actually something in the Hatha tradition that you actually do at an earlier phase, um, actually during mudras and bandha aspect, but just a very minor difference. And then moving up to Vigyanamaya Kosha, this is again um, where dhyana, meditative practices come in to really connect with the wisdom body and uh, tuning into our um, innate intelligence, our innate buddhi to contemplate um, what is uh, this sort of illusory identification with the, with the mind-body complex. Now, it's interesting because yamas and niyamas are not explicitly mentioned in Hatha Yoga practice, but are understood to actually still be prerequisites before undertaking this journey. And in the Hatha tradition, um, uh, these are also sometimes considered to be part of the Vigyanamaya Kosha, because again, the Vigyanamaya Kosha is the wisdom body. So remember, yamas and niyamas re re relate to our ethical conduct in the world. And so they're considered to be very um, important to be rooted in these values uh, when you undertake yoga, in part, as we'll see in, in, in uh, the next few slides, because when meditative, deep meditative practices are engaged in, sometimes siddhis or yogic powers may be opened or activated. And so you really need to have yamas and, and niyamas firmly rooted in the character of the yoga practitioner so that they don't get seduced and waylaid um, by by these yogic powers and, and sort of deviate from the actual task at hand, which is self-realization. And then the final step of Hatha Yoga is similar to uh, Patanjali's, which is uh, Samadhi. And um, really that engages the Ananda Mayakosha, which is the, the bliss body. Um, so I think this is uh, just a, a way of sort of mapping how Patanjali's yoga might sort of connect with Hatha Yoga. Um, and you can see, again, there's lots of similarities, but there's a little bit of a different approach to understanding how these practices actually re-spiritualize the body. Um, it's, the, it's a way of like engaging the body as uh, in its sacred dimensions as, um, an, as, as, a, as a kind of aspect of Purusha, as an inextricable integral manifestation of Purusha, not something separate from Purusha. So the, um, in these Hatha Yoga tradition, obviously asanas uh, play a very, very large part as they do in Patanjali's, but in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, he only actually mentions, um, you know, just a few lines, just two or three lines really talking about asanas and the importance of getting into a comfortable, seated, flexible pose that will serve you in your meditative practice it doesn't really elaborate very much um, beyond that. But Hatha Yoga is really the um, yoga text par excellence for really understanding and explicating asanas in all of their manifold glory. Um, so there's really three main Hatha Yoga texts um, that, are, uh, that are considered to be the, the cornerstone that ac actually have survived to the current day. There were probably, it was understood that there were probably many, many more Hatha Yoga texts that were actually passed on by oral tradition, but these were the, the three that happened to be written down and then passed down to us. So, so the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is uh, one, of the, one of those, and that really describes 84 asanas, including four seated postures. And then the Gheranda Samhita uh, actually states that there may be 8.4 million asanas that are out there, of which 84 are the most important. And then it goes on to describe 32 of these 84 in more detail, and particularly focuses on some of the ones that are intended for strengthening. And then the Shiva Samhita names 84 asanas as well, um, but um, really it focuses much more on outlining the non-dual yoga philosophy. Again, talking about how the body is a spiritual or divine energy uh, that should be harnessed and used in the journey of the spiritual seeker rather than something to be transcended. So the pranayama is also a very 
key part of both Patanjali's yoga as well as the Hatha tradition. Um, but, but again, just like with asanas, pranayamas are really elaborated upon and the whole idea of prana is really elaborated upon in the Hatha tradition. So the idea of the yogic body and the flow of prana through it um, has a very, very detailed elaboration within these texts. So it's understood that prana or life force um, is channeled in the body through 72 different nadis or channels. Uh, 72,000, sorry, 72,000 nadis or channels. Um, but these all eventually converge into the three most important nadis, which are the ida, the pingala, and the sushumna. So the uh, pandas, that I, uh, the bands, the energy locks, and the mudras that I mentioned earlier are actually really important practices for how to control or redirect prana through all of these channels, but particularly the ida, the pingala, and the sushumna. Now, in ordinary sort of waking existence for most of us, the balanced flow of prana through ida and pingala is really what confers health and longevity. And so a lot of the hatha yoga pranayams are really directed towards balancing the flow of ida and pingala. Um, and for example, if any of you have done alternate nostril breathing, this is a, a key um, pranayam that is intended to flow, to balance the flow of prana through the ida and the pingala. So the ida is supposed to be a lunar side of the yogic body and is concerned with mental energy and associated with, um, uh, with sometimes the female aspect or it's, it's um, sort of symbolized or the fem as the feminine aspect, the feminine principle. Um, and then the pingala is considered to be the solar aspect of the yogic body and is actually considered to be the, you know, very connected with um, rather than mental energy, physical energy, vital energy. And it's connected with the male uh, or, or symbolized as a kind of like masculine energy. So ida and pingala are the two energies that are usually related to like ordinary um, existence, the day-to-day -day existence that most of us are uh, familiar with. But then in yogic, uh, in yogic adepts, kundalini prana is also actually um, engaged. And um, we do this in the yoga tradition um, by, by actually opening up the sushumna channel, which is the central channel. So in most of us, the sushumna channel is closed off and prana really just flows through ida and pingala. But in yogic adepts, it actually, all of the uh, prana is channelized and concentrated into the central channel. And when that happens, um, we say that uh, it's understood that, uh, that uh, basically the kundalini shakti, the kundalini energy that is lying dormant at the base of the spine is then activated and rises up through different energy centers in the body called the chakras, six different chakras. And then sort of um, as it arises, it culminates in the seventh chakra, the sahasrara chakra. And that's the point at which um, the union of... Um, you know, of the individual prana with cosmic prana happens. So that universal energy that Priya was talking about is, is appreciated and understood to be one and the same as our individual prana. So this ascent of the kundalini to the top, to the sahasrara chakra, really signals the yogi's transcendence of ego consciousness and um, the yogi's blissful um, state of unity, ecstatic unity with cosmic consciousness. And this is the final limb of both Raja Yoga and Hatha Yoga. How Kundalini Shakti is sort of awakened and guided through the, through the different chakras is really a kind of focus or specialization of kundalini practices. And these kundalini practices, even though they're considered to be part of the Hatha tradition, are sometimes also just referenced as their own kundalini yoga, because there's such an emphasis on working with this very esoteric practice. So kriyas are very important in the kundalini um, as, for, as part of the awakening the kundalini uh, energy. Um, so kundalini in Sanskrit is translated as completed action, and it really refers to a set of practices, um, which are usually a combination, a very specific combination of pranayama, sound or mantra, 
and then particular asanas or postures. So you put all of these together in particular ways to achieve a specific outcome. Now there can be many, many different types of kriyas in Kundalini Yoga, and each kriya is aimed at a very specific outcome and has a very particular instructions that are associated with it. Like how long should the pose be held? Where should the point of eye contact be? Um, what kind of breath technique is used and how long should it be held and so on. Now, some kriyas are actually useful, very useful, just at um, balancing and harmonizing ida and pingala. So not all techniques, you know, not all kriyas are necessarily intended only for awakening kundalini shakti, but there are certain very powerful kriyas which are intended to free kundalini shakti. And when kundalini shakti or energy is awakened, then um, as I said, it rises up through each of these different chakras and activates them. And with the activation of each chakra, um, different yogic powers are supposed to accrue. So uh, for example, the ability to um, you know, teleport oneself or have telepathic abilities like ESP, like these are some of the siddhis that are said to arise with the activation of different chakras. Patanjali and many other yoga masters actually warn against the pursuit of siddhis. Uh, because they really are considered to be a distraction from the final goal of, um, of yoga practices, which is union, you know, with Purusha, with, with pure consciousness. And so the pursuit of Siddhis can sort of lead us down the path back towards, you know, ego identity. And so even if the Siddhis arise naturally through working with Kundalini energy, uh, the true yogi of the, the true yogi practitioners of Kundalini are just supposed to just, you know, just be very impassive and not act on these siddhis and continue with their uh, yogic practice. So now I'm just going to, uh, that was a, a bit of a, an esoteric explication of yoga. So now I'm just going to just quickly take us through uh, the journey of how did these traditions of um, of uh, yoga, of whether it was Patanjali's yoga or Tantra or Hatha yoga traditions, they were mainly practiced within India and Asia. So how did those reach the West? And that's going to be the topic for the next few slides. All right, so the very first um, person that I think uh, was considered to be very instrumental in the introduction of yoga to the West is Swami Vivekananda. So at the time that Vivekananda lived, um, uh, basically India was under British rule and there had been a lot of colo uh, uh, colonial powers, um, including the Portuguese and the French, as well as uh, the Netherlands who had actually um, been colonizing different parts of India. So Europe in general was really coming into contact with India, but the British were probably the most uh, uh, sort of dominant uh, European force that was in India. Uh, at that time, uh, because India was under British rule. Now, the, the British elite actually took quite a bit of interest in some of the uh, ancient uh, practices, um, spiritual traditions and practices of India. And at that time, um, Swami Vivekananda and other figures in Bengal, the Indian state of Bengal, uh, were really um, the focus of a lot of interest uh, among British colonials. So they actually began to have a conversation with, with Vivekananda about Hindu philosophy and about yoga. And he was subsequently invited to speak about Hinduism and yoga philosophy at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. And it was really his talk at this World Parliament of Religions was just a sensation and led to a meteor, meteoric rise in awareness in the United States about yoga. Um, Vivekananda ended up touring the United States and Europe throughout the 1890s and went on to publish a, a book called Raja Yoga in 1896, which was basically a translation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. It was one of the very first translations of um, uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras intended for a lay audience. And this really introduced a really, really wide group of Western readers to the ideas of yoga. Um, Vivekananda and his teachings were really embraced by uh, American intellectuals, including Ralph Waldo Emerson and the New England Transcendentalists, and um, just read to, led to a real um, very interesting uh, sort of enriching encounter between East and West about the ideas that were espoused in ancient yoga philosophy. 
And then the next uh, great figure that we have to mention in this journey of yoga from east to west is uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda. So um, he was a yoga practitioner also from Bengal who um, was studying under his master in India, but his, his yoga guru actually asked him in 1920 to bring the teachings of Kriya Yoga to the West. Now Kriya Yoga is um, considered to be a kind of form of Kundalini Yoga, but uh, uh, Yogananda always simply referred to it as Kriyananda. But you'll see by some of the um, you know, discussion that I had had previously about what Kriyas are and what their intentions are um, intended to do in terms of awakening uh, different energy channels in the body, it's basically considered to be a form of Kundalini Yoga. So uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda embarked on a very successful transcontinental speaking tour uh, across the United States before he settled in Los Angeles in, the in 1925. And he really just became a leading figure of the American yoga movement, particularly in LA and California. His focus was really to show the unity between Eastern and Western religions and to really preach about the importance of balancing materialism and spirituality. So again, back to that Hatha Yoga idea that, you know, um, that the body and mind, um, you know, Prakriti need to be understood as actually a manifestation of spirituality rather than considered to be at opposite ends you know, of the spectrum. So the materialism just needs to be transcended. But instead, you know, it's really about understanding how to live in a kind of um, sanctified, spiritualized body. He established the Self-Realization Fellowship um, initially in LA, but it eventually spread all over the United States and uh, United States and became hugely influential to the American yoga movement. And he also uh, published Autobiography of Yogi, in which he details um, his own journey as a yogi. And uh, this was um, uh, published to great acclaim, both in the lay audience as well as um, by other yoga practitioners. And um, just had a major impact on American yoga. Um, Steve Jobs was actually a big fan of Autobiography of Yogi. They say that this was the only book that he ever kept on his iPad. And at his funeral um, that was held, uh, you know, um, I think it was in 2014 when he passed away, at his funeral, uh, he had 500 copies of Autobiography of a Yogi distributed to each of the people that actually attended the, the memorial service. And then a uh, Krishnamacharya. So this was all like happening in the United States. This was about yoga, these two great yoga figures coming from India to the United States. But meanwhile, what was happening in India? So again, under British rule, um, yoga had an interesting encounter, you know, with this British um, culture, physical culture at that time. There was this great emphasis on fitness and exercise regime. Um, and this became very, very popular in India as well. So Krishnamacharya was a really renowned Ayurvedic physician and yoga teacher from Mysore. And he became an enthusiast of physical culture as well and became very interested in understanding the therapeutic potential of Hatha Yoga. So he ended up developing a kind of modern yoga practice that was a blend of traditional Hatha Yoga with certain aerobic aspects um, that he observed in the physical culture of the British, um, something akin to calisthenics. So he sort of pioneered um, this new brand of modern yoga, yoga, which sort of paired asanas with pranayam. That was actually a very pioneering thing to do, to, to pair breath with asana, which really hadn't been done until then. And he was sort of uh, inspired to do that by the calisthenic movement in part. Um, he's often called the modern, the father of modern yoga because of his wide influence on subsequent development of postural yoga. Now, Krishnamacharya notably never left India but the modern practices of Hatha Yoga that he developed ended up migrating to the West through his students who were among the most influential global yoga teachers of the 20th century. So BKS Iyengar, founder of Iyengar Yoga, was one of his students. Pratavi Joyce, who was a founder of Ashtanga Yoga, was one of his students. And then his own son, Desikachar, who, uh, who was a founder of Vin Vini Yoga, was also uh, his student. Now, other major influences in terms of uh, yoga 
uh, in the West, the way that it developed in the West. So, in, so all of those three uh, great yoga teachers that I just mentioned in the previous slide um, really came to the forefront in American awareness during the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s. And at that time, yoga practices, including meditation, became widely embraced by Western youth. Um, there's just a couple of photos here. You can see here the Beatles um, went to India to Rishikesh and studied with uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And then uh, on the right, you'll see a photo of Swami Sachitananda at Woodstock. He actually opened the uh, music festival at Woodstock and was subsequently known as the Woodstock Guru. But this kind of shows you how much the yoga practices really ended up being very much part of the counterculture at that time. Um, but then other major influences and in other major figures in terms of bringing yoga to the West are also listed here in addition to Swami Sachitananda, who went on to form the Integral Yoga Institutes um, here in America, as well as in Europe, number of other figures, Yogi Bhajan, Swami Vishnu Devananda, who brought and established Sivananda Yoga here, um, and many others. So I apologize that I can't fit all of them in, but I've tried to mention some of them here. So then by the 1980s, so up until the 1980s, like in the 60s and 70s, as I said, yoga was really associated still with very much of a countercultural tradition. But by the 1980s and 1990s, yoga really moved into the mainstream and it was taken up by a whole new generation of practitioners who didn't really see themselves as counterculture, but simply were interested in the physical and mental health benefits of yoga. And it was at this point that yoga classes started to be offered in large studios and gyms as a form of exercise that may or may not really have um, emphasized any of the origins of yoga as a spiritual practice. Uh, the variety of yoga styles greatly expanded with many different schools and many different teachers sort of branding yoga in their own style and teaching it. And then teacher training programs really proliferated. These 200 uh, hour teacher training programs really proliferated and also then ended up becoming ways that yoga became accessible to a lot more people. So then uh, the next few slides are really that in part due to the popularity of yoga in the 80s and 90s as a way of um, promoting health and well-being, it started to be actually studied by the NIH as mind-body medicine. And uh, started, started, to be, uh, started, started to be studied by different um, medical researchers as a form of mind-body medicine. But just to show you at that time, just um, how um, popular that yoga was becoming, like by the early 2000s, um, seven and a half percent of US adults had participated in a yoga class sometime in the prior six months. This was just like, this is millions of people, you know, over four or 5 million people, I think is what that a number refers to. It's so very different from those few countercultural youth that may have been taking it up in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I'm going to skip over the next couple of slides in the interest of time because um, I think uh, the whole idea of yoga as mind-body medicine is something that we'll be addressing and touching on in later um, parts of this. But I will just close by just saying that um, yoga in the 21st century has just really arrived. Uh, this was uh, President Barack Obama in 2013 really saying, yoga has become a universal language of spiritual exercise in the United States, crossing many lines of religion and culture. Every day, millions of people practice yoga to improve their health and overall well-being. And he was promoting yoga as one option to pursue um, as part of the Presidential Active Lifestyle Award. Thank you, Sudha. All right. Just to end this out, we have a little food for thought for you just about yoga and the popularity that it's gained and how it's changed. I hope you've seen now how it's changed from what its original form was to what it is now. And there's been a lot of articles. This is sort of a hot topic right now. Um, and in many years, it has been about appreciation versus appropriation. And so I just wanted to kind of bring it up as some, some thoughts about this. You know, appreciation is defined as seeking to understand and to learn about another culture in an effort to broaden perspectives and connect with others cross-culturally. That's appreciation. 
versus appropriation, which is the inappropriate or the unacknowledged adoption of an element or elements of one's culture by members of another culture often used for personal gain. And so there's been a lot of talk about this appreciation versus appropriation within yoga. And some of the ideas come from some of the things that have happened, right? They, the popularization has led to commercialization. You get high-end yoga brands and merchandise. There's so many new types of yoga. Yin, which actually doesn't come from any, any um, that actually doesn't even come from an Indic philosophy at all. There's, there's, um, there's yogas like Bikram that have been trademarked or even tried to be copyrighted restorative power all this stuff and then like we talked about in the beginning some extreme practices like goat and beer yoga that are definitely more on the entertainment value side than they are and the spiritual side now just some questions sort of to leave you with here one question is we hear this word yogi thrown around quite a bit and the question really is does an asana practice make you a yogi a yogi used to be a very revered term, somebody who, like we had talked about at the very beginning, had devoted themselves to these, to these paths, that, that jnana path or that karma path. And so is this term sort of being thrown around a little bit, or does it maybe, maybe it really means that in colloquialisms, this has become sort of our, our uh, you know, it's part of the vernacular in English. There's also some claims of non-Indic basis of yoga. Sometimes different religious tags will be added to yoga classes. Um, sometimes, um, you know, even particular areas, lots of different types of yoga have come about with different cultural aspects added to it. And then there's a big question of is yoga itself just prone to exploitation? Because we talked about the pluralisms in yoga, there's so many different aspects to it. There's so many different interpretations to it. There's multiple paths of yoga. There's different ways to get to the same goal. And because this is based on interpretations of texts, of Sanskrit texts, right? Of Sanskrit texts that most people who have not, even those who have, who have you know, done a PhD in Sanskrit, those are the ones who are studying it and trying to interpret it. And so it leaves it open to a lot of things which may make it more vulnerable to these things. We wanted to leave you with one quote before we get to the questions real quickly. And that is that yoga does not change the way we see things, but it transforms the person who sees, which is of course from BKS Iyengar. Yeah, so I have some questions ready here. I have a couple here. Um, well, I think the first one um, was uh, referring to those chants that you played, Priya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe you can address the question is, how do the traditional chants you mentioned compare to current kirtan? Mm, okay, very good question. So they compare, so the Vedic chants, the way that one is supposed to actually chant in a Vedic manner, it's very... Um, it's almost very methodical. It's it's very boxed in. There's not room for change or error. Okay. There's even certain tonalities to it. I think it only keeps three tones or three notes that one is supposed to use. The chanting is supposed to almost take you to a somewhat meditative place. The kirtan, on the other hand, can be more attuned to something like a bhajan or a hymn that one is singing. It's more of a devotional song. It's supposed to invoke the sort of the power of the group, and it's supposed to be more of an emotional energy. So you can almost consider it more of that bhakti, that devotional um, type of practice that we were talking about. Great. Um, there's a second question. Um, maybe I'll take this one. Are yogi and swami titles? Uh, do the titles indicate level of education or level of enlightenment or practice? Um, what do they actually re refer to? Um, it's a great question because I because we did use both of those phrases quite a bit uh, during the talk. Um, so yogi um, refers to somebody. Um, it's a more broad term. Yogi refers to someone who considers themselves to be a practitioner of yoga in the fullest form, yoga as a kind of spiritual pursuit, not as just asana practice. <laughs> so I've, I've, it's become quite a trend actually, Priya and I were discussing, it's become quite a trend that if you go to a yoga class and you do a few asanas or pranayamas, 
um, it's become a, a thing to be able to call yourself a yogi um, if, because you do that. But actually in the yoga tradition to be respectful of that term, that terminology, it was really when one really undertakes yoga in a very um, deep and profound way as a path uh, to, uh, to sort of deepening your spiritual awareness. Now, that being said, that being said, um, not all yogis necessarily are renunciates or ascetics, as Priya was saying. Some yogis, like, like for example, um, uh, Krishnamacharya, who is a master yogi, and he's the, the founder of all of those um, Mysore schools of yoga that uh, I showed in my slide. He was a householder. He was married. He had children. He continued to have uh, social duties as a physician, um, as a teacher. Um, throughout his life. So he did not become a renunciate or an ascetic. A person who becomes a renunciate or an ascetic is called a swami. That word swami is reserved for those who take up the path of jnana. Jnana, remember um, Priya was mentioning, was someone who dedicates themselves solely to the pursuit of spiritual truth without engaging in so societal duties as well. So swami refers to a renunciate or an ascetic. Whereas yogi can be a broader term for those who are pursuing uh, spiritual truth through yoga practice. So then I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna punt this one to you. It's, could you please recommend a good Hatha yoga video program? I don't know. Yeah, that's a <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I would say, uh, you know, right now I'm not, I'm not in a position to really recommend a good video program. I would really, you know, yoga, practice traditionally is done with the teacher. It's not something that you teach yourself, you know, with your, with videos or whatnot. And yes, I realize that in the age of, you know, the pandemic and Zoom, a lot of people are doing yoga classes, but I would really encourage people that are interested in Hatha Yoga to really go to, you know, a younger, to go to a younger yoga studio or to, you know, or to a, um, you know, a Vini Yoga class or one of the more traditional Hatha Yoga traditions or schools and really, um, ex like really explore uh, how yoga taught in those environments in which more of the traditional elements are also understood to be part of the goal, how that might be experienced, as opposed to just going to a yoga class or gym or trying to do stuff off YouTube, which can be, which can be an important way to, to sort of practice and perfect your routine. But I would say start with a teacher in real life. So I think that concludes our um, Q&A session. Mm -hmm.